Hi folks, this is Big Mike, Mike Zlatny. And today we're going to cover investment quadrants. This is a very short introductory video. Many of you have seen, have heard this topic and many you could enjoy it for the first time. So why it's important. These investment quadrants is a very powerful educational tool and an investment planning tool uh, to be able to make better decisions, uh, how to deploy your capital, with the perspective of uh, thinking strategically before making tactical decisions, what to invest in, how much to invest. So the Wall Street has the terms of conservative investing, moderate investing, aggressive investing. The Main Street, uh, or in this methodology that I developed, um, there are investment grade deals and there are speculative grade deals. And I'm specifically going to talk about real estate. This is my area of specialty. This is what I know. This methodology could be applied beyond uh, real estate. But let me focus on just the real estate component. So there are four quadrants. Quadrant one, quadrant two, which fall in the category called investment grade quadrants. These quadrants have typically good downside protection and other features. But let me just talk a little bit about quadrant three and four. So quadrant three and four are speculative grade quadrants. They carry higher degree of, of risk and they have limited or no downside protection. And then quadrant one and three are cash flow focused quadrants. These are income focused quadrants. And quadrant two and four are growth or appreciation focused quadrants. These are strategic uh, views on how to think about uh, investing. When any deal comes in in front of you, you could decide what quadrant it falls into based on the understanding of the risk rewards of the deal. And then make an appropriate decision, does it fit into your investment strategy? So most folks first understand the quadrants, then they decide how much capital to allocate in each quadrant based on the entire portfolio. And that would be, uh, in line with their risk profile, their need for cash flow, their need for liquidity, their need for tax benefits and so on. And once they do that, they look for deals that fall into appropriate quadrants. The alternative methodology would be to look at each deal, what comes in front of you and say, does it fall in the right investment quadrant that you're looking for to invest a certain amount of capital and then decide how much capital to invest. In other words, if you find a deal in quadrant four and you're only looking to deploy 200,000 in the quadrant four, you could decide, okay, this is one of the deals I want to invest in. I'm going to write an appropriately smaller check. But if it's a quadrant one deal, I'm more comfortable with a lower level of risk and I can invest in the quadrant a larger check. This is basic methodology, how you do it. Again, let me cover the quadrant. So quadrant one deal, uh, the quadrant one, uh, contains deals that have good downside protection. And downside protection mechanisms vary. But in a minute, you're going to see some examples of downside protection. Obviously, low to moderate risk and good cash flow. These are important characteristics of quadrant one. For example, first lien mortgages or first lien uh, deeds of trust, uh, basically performing notes, loans, that's secured by a real property in first lien position fall into this category typically at a conservative loan to value ratio, obviously. And some conservative equity deals where you are in an equity position and there is proper uh, mortgage leverage um, and this strong cash flow and other characteristics of good downside protection. These type of deals could or typically fall in a quadrant one uh, in this model. Quadrant two deals have a similar downside protection and moderate to low risk, but they have no or limited cash flow. That's the biggest distinction between quadrant one and two. Quadrant one has cash flow, quadrant two doesn't have the cash flow, has very little cash flow. And examples of the quadrant two deals would be first lien non performing notes, meaning that these are the first lien mortgages that went into a default. Now, you could say, wait a minute. What about the risk on defaulted notes? Well, if these notes are at the conservative loan to value ratio and you have fairly easy time to foreclose on these properties and you can, you can get an asset through foreclosure at a discounted price through 
conservative loan to value. What is conservative loan to value? An example would be 60%, could be 65%. These are generally considered uh, to be conservative loan to value ratios. So at that ratio, when you foreclose on a property, you can typically get it, sell it, recover all your principal, recover all your interest, might make, it might make an additional profit. Uh, also, some deals with uh, equity deals with moderate leverage, as I mentioned, uh, some value add projects where the cash flow is low at the start because there's value at work and the cash flow is not expected to be substantial at the start. But there are elements of good downside protection. And in further presentations in the future, I'll cover in depth how uh, to evaluate deals. But in this presentation, this is intended to be short. So just imagine first lien debt, performing falls into quadrant one, non-performing quadrant two, some equity deals with good cash flow, with good downside protection falling in quadrant one, and some falling in quadrant two that have downside protection, but low or no initial cash flow. Now let us jump into quadrant three and four. So quadrant three and four are speculative grade quadrants. They generally carry substantial amount of risk, including the risk to your principal, you could lose a portion of your money or the entire investment. So something to keep in mind. However, these deals, generally speaking, have greater upside. If you don't get greater upside, why invest into greater risk? This is one of the most important principles of investing. The reward has to be commensurate with the risk. So if you're taking greater risk, you better receive higher upside. Otherwise, why take the risk? So these deals typically in quadrant three and four have limited downside protection. And in quadrant three, they, they need to start with good cash flow. You're taking on more risk um, and you're focusing on cash flow. You better be receiving good cash flow. If you're not getting good cash flow, typically you should be getting higher cash flow than quadrant one. The reason for this, you're taking on more risk. So it's something to keep in mind. So se second lien uh, notes secured by typically second lien mortgage. Uh, or a deed of trust, and some highly leveraged deals that generate initial cash flow, but they could backfire. Uh, we'll give you some other examples, non-real estate. So investing in some energy products, uh, when the oil price is high, generating high yield, but the, when the price uh, drops and the energy prices could be volatile, the cash flow could uh, disappear. In fact, the, the investment could be in trouble if the oil price drops too much. So the reason I'm using this as an example is that you understand how to use the model. You have to think about what is the level of risk? What am I investing in? Under what circumstances uh, the deals do well and under what circumstances could they run into trouble? So that's quadrant three. It's again, speculative grade with cash flow. Quadrant four are the deals with limited downside protection and no initial cash flow. Basically, these are growth deals, heavily growth deals. So what falls into that category? Generally speaking, development from ground up, redevelopment of assets. So redeveloping of an, of an old um, big box retailer to a self-storage facility, land speculation, and heavy value at projects where there's a lot of work and there's substantial risk associated with construction. So these type of deals, and there are other deals that would fall into category into quadrant four, but I'm just giving you some examples of these deals. And generally speaking, um, you could write a check into any quadrant. Uh, it just has to meet your financial plans, your risk reward tolerance, your need for income, your your uh, level of uh, risk tolerance level, your level of um, uh, comfort with the higher or lower risk. If you can't sleep well at night, why take the risk? So again, these quadrants, just uh, educational methodology, but it's a very powerful tool that can help you build a portfolio in real estate and outside of real estate that meets your investment objectives and something that gives you clarity into what you have invested in and the expectation of risk of work performance. Appreciate your time and attention until the next presentation. Thank you kindly.